Welcome back to the Spirit Truth Worship Podcast. My name is Dalton Schaefer, and I'm a worship leader at my local church. Today, we are on with a guest, Aaron Ivey. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on here. Yeah, excited to have you here. Aaron is the pastor of worship and creativity at the Austin Stone Church. And just if anybody's watching this and maybe they don't know a lot about your church, would you just share a little bit about the context in which you serve? Sure. Yeah, we're in Austin, Texas. Uh, Our church is a 17-year-old church plant. Um, We have six congregations uh, scattered throughout the city of Austin, Um, one in the middle in downtown, and then the other five that um, kind of make a circle around the city. And so we're in, um, uh, you know, every kind of corner and pocket of, of the city, and each congregation has like its own its own personality and demographic, which is, which is really awesome to see. Um, and then I, I lead our creative team. So our creative team is made up of, uh, worship, production, design, communication, and film. And so those are the creative people that I get to have the privilege of leading and serving. Awesome. Very cool. How long have you been at the stone? Man, this fall, uh, marks uh, 14 years that I've been here. Awesome. It, yeah. In some ways it's like flown by in other ways. It seems like we're just getting started. You know, our church has evolved yeah. throughout the years, just like the city of Austin has changed and evolved um, like crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like unrecognizable from what it was when I moved here in 2007, wow. 2008, uh, something like that. Yeah. But I love it here, oh, man. Cool. This is the place that I feel like I um, was kind of you know, like made to minister in austin texas i just i love the people i love the vibe i love the city love where i'm at wow well that's awesome i'll say from the outside looking in you look like the guy who was made to minister in austin texas (laughs) tatted up cool as they come yeah man i love it well very cool well today we want to talk about engagement i know this is one of uh the things that you guys have uh you really think about well when it comes to engagement and worship at the stone. And I personally, I shared with this, uh, with you before we started, but I've been deeply impacted by the teaching that you guys have on engagement through uh, some courses you used to offer and through ongoing, just hearing you guys, the way you shepherd, uh, and even like the guys that I've known who have been discipled by guys on your team. I learned from those guys too. Like you guys are doing a great job developing and equipping Thanks, leaders. Man. And so, Thanks, uh, yeah, I just would love to jump in and talk. So when we talk about engagement, I, the first question would be, what is the relationship between theology and expression in your mind? Like, what are you thinking when you talk about those two things together? Yeah, I mean, obviously, theology is super important. And um, I'm sure your listeners are coming from a variety of different theological um, convictions or cultures yeah. in their church. Um, but I think the the richer and kind of deeper um, you go theologically, uh, the richer your expression um, should go to, you know, the more that you yeah. discover about the love of God and the truths of what his character is like and what his heart is like. Um, that's meant to actually drive you towards more expression, not less. Yeah. And yeah. You know, we happen to be in, um, in a reformed church and a lot of times uh, reformed churches error on the side of like highlighting theology to the deficit of highlighting expression. And I think um, there's a, a real value and there's a real need to highlight both of those. The more that you fall in yeah. love with the God of the scripture, the more expressive you should be um, in your personal worship, in the way you serve your community, in your corporate worship. And so I see those things like working together um, and, yeah. uh, and, and making expression in a Sunday gathering actually uh, deeper and richer and more freeing because there's a, a depth of theology. So I think they, they both, they both affect each other. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, which is probably why I had you on my podcast. Cause we do things <laughs> similarly about this, but it's, yeah, yeah, if it's true that our worship is a response to God's revelation, it would then be true that the more we understand God's revelation to us, the deeper we go in theology, the, the more clearly we see Christ, the more we would worship, the greater, our, like we would be more committed yeah. to lifting our hands to the holy place and blessing the Lord when we see the Lord is eternally worthy to be blessed. And Absolutely. so, no, I Absolutely. love that. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up um, around church. I wasn't a Christian until my freshman year of college. 
when I was uh, 18 years old, but I grew up in a church where, um, you know, theology was was definitely important, but, uh, you know, there was like zero expression. I remember one time yeah. uh, a lady that was singing a song on stage, like closed her eyes while she was singing and she got reprimanded from like the church <laughs> leadership, you know? And so there was no like freedom to be expressive. If anything, it was frowned upon. And then I just started noticing like in the scripture, anybody who had an encounter with God, anybody, um, yeah. never ever lacked expression. You know, when, when Jesus stepped into somebody's life and healed them or saved them or spoke a word to them, there there was expression. It's like the most natural thing in the world for a follower of Jesus to do is to be expressive. Yeah. Even in the Old Testament, you see, um, you know, people meeting with God and the tabernacle shaking, you know, and, and yeah. there, there was obviously expression there. And so uh, I'm really convicted about that. And when we talk about engagement, that that's really at the heart of it is, um, having the posture as a worship leader of one of my roles is to foster uh, a sense of engagement in the room. Like I want people to engage with each other. I want to engage with them and I want them and us to engage with God. So it's kind of like this horizontal and vertical combination yeah, yeah. of engagement, not just watching or listening, but engaging with the living God and engaging with, uh, with your community to your left and to your right. And that's kind of what we mean when we say engagement. It's like focusing. That's yeah. one of our five core foundations, like you mentioned. Um, it's one of the five most important things that we think about when we're leading our people or leading our teams is, hey, are we engaging with each other? And uh, are we engaging with God? Yeah. Wow. I think that's great. When I think of those conversations, uh, my brain goes to a couple of different places, which one is like, what's then the relationship that you see between excellence and engagement? And then as you're thinking of, uh, horizontal and vertical, which are the same. I mean, that's exactly how we talk about it with our team is like, okay, one, we're addressing one another. It says in Colossians three and Ephesians five, these are like two, like worship leader verses. We should hide them in our hearts. Let right. the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, singing Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and be filled with the spirit right. as you address one another in Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So there's this element where we're addressing one another. There's also an element where in both of those verses, it says, as we also sing to the Lord. And so as you're thinking through that, what is the, yeah, I guess we'll just start with like, where does excellence in that conversation, is that a part of engagement for you guys? Do those fuel one another, like excellence fuels engagement? Because when we're less distracting, people can engage more. What all are you thinking in, in, in terms of that? Yeah, excellence is something that I think um, the church is a little bit scared of um, using that word yeah. excellence because it's yeah. been... Uh, it's been used uh, incorrectly. It's been like abused, you know, like um, yeah. it's been traded for perfection. So we got to, everything's got to be perfect and everything's got to be glossy. Um, and that's not at all what excellence is, but excellence, there is a part of excellence that we should strive for because we are honoring the Lord with like our gifts. You know, you think about in the Old Testament, when they were building the temple, God gave them all these really clear instructions. I want you to, you know, paint purple yeah. pineapples here, and I want you to use this kind of metal, and I want you to use this kind of fabric for the curtains. Yep. And it was excellent. Like, He cares a lot about excellence. And so I always want to challenge, like, our church and our team and other churches to not be afraid to pursue excellence because when yeah. we're doing that, we're actually honoring God if our heart is coming from a place of, like, man, I want to present something great for the Lord. I want something that's pure and authentic, but also something that I've like practiced and I've worked on and I've honed in my skill and I've put in the time and energy that it takes to be good at my craft, you know? And I think where it kind of collides with uh, engagement is it's really hard for people to engage when there's like a lack of excellence, you know, when you have somebody yeah. showing up that didn't rehearse the songs or uh, didn't put the time and attention into really planning like the, the liturgy of a Sunday in an excellent, beautiful way, that's distracting, you know? And so we talk about yeah. uh, wanting to have undistracting excellence where the excellence in the room, whether it's musical or the environment or how things look or feel, the fact that there's not trash and garbage on the stage and uh, yeah. things look in order helps people see past all that and actually be engaged with community and with the Lord. And so I think excellence is something we should unashamedly strive for and even push our musicians yeah. or our teams toward because, man, it, it honors the Lord when we have a heart that's like, I want to do everything that I possibly can 
to be a good steward of the skill that God's given me and the gifting he's given me. I want to steward that well. And so that means working hard and practicing yeah. Yeah. and becoming better and developing constantly, yeah. you know? Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think, uh, it's like both, uh, like as we're more excellent, at what we do, we're less distracting to others. I also think like, even in terms of like memorizing music <clears throat> that yeah. then we're actually freed up once we know where we're not distracted by the chord chart or something in front of us, it both frees us up to engage others better, but also for us in the moment to worship the Lord without just thinking through like the competencies of getting the right notes or making sure we don't miss the chords. Oh, really? So I think it, yeah, it, could, it goes both ways. And so. Yeah, I, I think that's super helpful. Where, where do you also think through in terms of, yeah, the side of like we're engaging with the Lord? I know something we say with our team a lot is we want to be worshipers before we're worship leaders. And so mm -hmm. uh, we all know the the struggle of being a worship leader. Um, you get up on a stage, you stick a spotlight in your face, you get a microphone in front of you, like right. you put a guitar on, you look like a rock star, and then you're like, but it's not about me, it's about Jesus. Mm -hmm. right. And I don't think the spotlights are the problem, I think our hearts are the problem. <clears throat> but yeah, I found there to be like some rhythms that we can put in place. And so like we get together uh, before we go out and lead worship, we circle up in the back, like our green room, like we don't use it, we don't go back there during the sermon or anything, but it's like where we keep the water bottles and stuff. Yeah. And we'll just circle up and we pray together, and and then we usually sing a song like we'll worship mm -hmm. in the secret place before we go worship in the public space is this kind of oh, reminder cool. that, Hey, we yeah. actually want to engage with God. And it's like, yeah, it's like takes extra time. And <clears throat> yeah, we have to like structure our, our rehearsals and our time in between and like what time we show up to accommodate for this extra time that we're going to take to do that. But when you're thinking through that aspect, so like excellence helps us to engage people without distraction. Mm -hmm. What about the other side? Like how are we helping people engage with the Lord, both from a team standpoint, but also your congregation? Yeah, man. I mean, that's super important because we do live in 2021, which is, you know, a, a, a performing culture, right? It's like, yeah, Everybody's Instagram. on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, 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 where everything has to be edited and filtered and, and trying to yeah. always present our best um, our best face, which is not always our true face. And so mm. I think it's helpful for uh, the worship leader to constantly be reminded, like, I'm not a performer, I'm a worshiper. And then for that worship leader to also keep communicating that and pressing that forward in every person on the team, whether it's the yeah. person running production in the back or it happens to be the um the drummer you know um that's thinking about the click track and starting all that stuff like hey at the end of the day you're not a performer for these people yeah. you're a worshiper and so that for us starts all the way back um in in rehearsal like rehearsal culture is a huge part of that um you know so yeah. each rehearsal that we have with our bands um really is focused on a couple things one, it's focused on um, the, like community, like actually being friends and um, you know enjoying a meal together or hanging out afterwards, that sort of thing. So it's it's a family unit more than like a, a gig, right? Taking that yeah. kind of mindset completely out. Um, so it always has an element of community, and then it has an element of uh, prayer. Um, we want our bands to be prayerful about Sundays, you know, not just to yeah. show up with all the parts nailed, but hey, we're going to pray for Sunday. Here's what the sermon is about. Here's where we're going. Here's some needs in our congregation that we can pray for. What do we need to pray for you about? What, what What's going on in your life? You know, some real intentional time for praying together as as a, a worship team. And then the, the practicing part, like, um, hey, you know, we've got an hour and a half here. Let's make sure that we're like actually showing up and we are sharpening um our musicianship and we're making sure yeah. that you know transitions are smooth and that the tracks all work and all that kind of stuff it's like the technical stuff but also the the heart stuff too and so it starts all yeah. the way back in rehearsals and then same thing that you do you know with uh times before um and times after the worship set of just like hey let's circle up again let's thank let's thank god that he actually answered those mm. prayers and that he actually moved in yeah. people's life regardless of like us and what kind of burdens we brought into this place or sin we had uh, over the weekend, man, he used mm. us. Unbelievable. He did that. Not our performance did yeah. that. He did that. Yeah. So, so good. It's, yeah. It's just like constantly having that at the front of the mind. Like we are not performers. We are worshipers first. And that's just really yeah. difficult to keep in the front of your mind when you 
when you do have a mic in front of your face and you do have the lights and the, the spotlight and you're the loudest singer and you're the, um, you know, you're the upfront visible person. It's difficult, yeah. but um, it's reminding each other that and, and pushing uh, each other upward, you know, instead of like yeah. just kind of focused in on the music part. Yeah, that's so good. I love it. A lot of it seems to come back to like setting a culture, which mm -hmm. I think is something that as worship leaders, like it, it's easy to, to know that we have to plan songs and do rehearsals and execute services. But I sometimes I wonder if like one of the most important things we do as worship leaders is actually setting a culture in our church where people are expecting to meet with the Lord, yeah. <clears throat> believe in the scriptures, like a culture we like come like God's word is being opened and we can trust that his word never returns void. And so as it opens up, like he's right. going to transform us. Right. And so a lot of it comes back to like, yeah, being a culture setter for your team. And so what would you say are some of the like main scriptures as people think about engagement mm -hmm. or maybe even how excellence fuels engagement and vice versa? What would be like just a handful of scriptures or just one or two even that you're thinking through that really have helped drive you both like in a theological conviction, but then have also just like proven to be true. Like God's word does the work. And so as we remember that his word says this, like it, it fuels that worship in us. Yeah. Well, I think the most profound moment that I think of is, uh, you know, before Jesus went to the cross, he sat at a table uh, with his friends that he did ministry with. And they just, they hung out together. They like broke bread. Um, they enjoyed the company of each other, right? There was nothing performing mm. about that at all. They were yeah. literally at a wooden table together um, with the living God, you know? And even Jesus was postured in a way of like serving and giving. He's the one that broke the bread. He's the one that that poured the yeah. wine. And, and when I think about engagement, that's, that's one of the uh, portions of scripture that always stick out to me is like, okay, I'm not Jesus in the story at all, but I am as the worship leader kind of setting the table. I, I am like making sure that there's a seat at the table for everybody, like putting that invitation out of, Hey, would you come with me? Because we get to sit at the table with Jesus and we get to engage with him. I wish we could see mm -hmm. him face to face or look into his eyeballs. We can't, but we are with the spirit of the living God. And in every single worship service that we have the opportunity to lead people, we're actually inviting them to something that, that God is, is doing, you know? And I think when we yeah. keep that in mind, it, it puts engagement like in the right framework and it takes the pressure off of us to um, you know, come up with the meal and be the Jesus figure and be the Messiah or be the performer where it's no man. Hey, we've done the work here of cleaning up the room. We've done the work of making sure there's a seat here for you. And now let's sit together and let's look at Jesus. Let's listen to Jesus. Let's open up his word. Let's sing to yeah. him. You know, in one of the gospel accounts, um, it says that uh, after they broke bread and drank wine together that they they sang a song together that they went out singing mm. and so that's always the picture that comes into my mind when i wow. think about this engagement in a corporate worship kind of setting yeah yeah that's so good it just reminds me of uh just the thought from from hebrews which is that we don't like as worship leaders, like the burden isn't on us to create the moment or to usher people into the presence of God or right. be the Jesus figure. Like we're not the great right. high priest that offered ourselves up in the holy places before the Lord. Like Jesus has done the work. Now we're invited to draw near to God. Mm -hmm. And then as we draw near, he draws near to us. It's like, yeah, we don't have to do the work though. Where do you see the relationship between engagement? This wasn't something we talked about before, but just off the top of my head, as you're talking, yeah, like, Where's the relationship between liturgy and engagement? Do you see any connection even in the, the rhythms of our weekly services that help foster engagement? Yeah, absolutely, man. Um, liturgy, you know, I didn't start using that word liturgy until um, probably about 10 years ago. We always tried to steer clear from that. And I don't know why. I don't know where that baggage kind of came from. But I always thought about liturgy as being like too ordered or too old school, um, too ancient, mm. you know, and so we want to be more free and we want to be more spirit led. Um, and there is a beautiful truth, man, that like the spirit can lead um, while we still also discern how his spirit is telling us to plan liturgy. There's something great about ancient, um, you know, Christian patterns of like, hey, we're going to pray this prayer uh, every time we gather or every, um, you know, every fifth Sunday of every month, there's going to be this part of 
uh, a liturgical pattern. That, at the end of the day, that's all liturgy is. Liturgy is, is structure. And God yeah. uses liturgy to remind us of what's always been true. It's like kind of blending the modern and the ancient, which is so important for us. And if you think about it, we're all liturgical in some way, in some way, man. I yeah. mean, most of us wake up every morning and we drink a cup of coffee or we come home and yeah. we, um, you know, turn on Netflix or whatever. Like we are liturgical by nature. We're creatures of yeah. like habit and pattern, you know? And so I think with engagement, having um, some sort of liturgy that you are holding on to, whether it is like a little bit blurry, you know, um, or it's very, very rigid. You know, I think about my friends in like the Anglican church or in the Presbyterian church, there are very like structured parts of their liturgy. And there's something really beautiful about that. And that helps the heart engage. It helps the mind engage. It helps um, the people who are coming to our congregations go, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do right now. I know what I'm supposed to sing and why I'm going to sing this. And I know why we're taking up an offering. It's not just to put dollars in the offering plate, you know, but liturgy absolutely helps with engaging the heart and the mind and the soul. No, that's great. I would say what now, as we're thinking through engagement, would you say are some tips uh, if you want to help your worship team? So these are maybe some, if you're leading a big church with multiple staff, you're talking about your staff guys, but also the volunteers who are on stage with you. <clears throat> what is some in, like maybe weekly encouragement you could give them? Mm -hmm. And then what is some like broader, like, Hey, we really want to dig in and grow in engagement. What would you talk through with your team that'll be leading with you? Yeah, we talk through this often. Um, and that's why engagement is one of our core values. Um, uh, I think it's like really natural for um, musicians and artists to um, be engaged when they're, you know, just playing a show like, somewhere else, you know, or yeah. a lot of our musicians, you know, are, are in another band. And so they're doing shows on Sixth Street or whatever. And it feels natural in those moments for them to be expressive and to be engaged. But for some reason, when they get to church, it's like, oh, am I not supposed to be engaged? Am I not supposed to be like uh, physically and visibly zealous? And so we just call that out and talk about it all the time. Like, man, you you are you are called as a, a an image bearer of God and a leader of people. You're you're called to actually let that expression that is in your heart because i know you love jesus to let that spill out and let yeah. your personality come out because it actually is shepherding people and it's freeing them up you know so we have a choir downtown and you know they're not practicing parts there's nobody up there like leading them like that they're really just like hey you are helping teach our congregation what it looks like to be freed up to be engaged yeah. to be expressive not only with your vocal cords but with your the posture of your body you know and so on a weekly basis we we do remind people that hey you don't have to be impressive you're not performing you don't have to fake it at all but man let that personality and let that love for the lord and that zeal that you have for him let that come out don't be afraid to let that come out like that, that it should come out you know yeah. um and so we also have like a culture of feedback where literally just this week one of our worship leaders asked for some feedback and I happened to be in the room at, um, at her congregation and I was able to give feedback like, Hey, I know your bass player probably loves the Lord, but it didn't look like that. And so yeah. free them up, right. To actually let that come out and to be expressive on stage and to be yeah. engaged. It's why we want all of our worship leaders and bands to be on the front row during all the sermons. I mean, we've all seen like, a worship band just totally split off the stage and go back to the green room when the, yes. the sermon starts. But what that communicates is my part's done. Now it's that person's part and I'm not engaged with that, but I'll re-engage whenever the next song starts. You know, it's like the yes. little bitty things of being present in the room, being present in the foyer, being present with people before and after, and then actually being present in that moment of, even if I didn't have a guitar on, and even if I wasn't up here on the stage, would my heart be like engaged and interactive and zealous for these truths that we're singing and this person that we're singing to, you know, there, there needs to be some yes. congruence there where that matches and lines up. And so it's, it's conversations like that happening all the time. Yeah. I love that talking about like engaging with the sermon. Cause that's one thing 
I feel like every church I've gone to, it, it, to some uh, extent, there is a culture of like the worship band walks off and goes back to the green room and maybe the yeah. sermon's on real low in the back. And yeah. at some point over the last few years, just the conviction, I think the Lord doing something in my heart. And I've always been one who like wanted to sit out in the room, but almost more of like a sitting out, like shows my congregation that I value the word. Yeah. But then there's like another level over the last two years that I, I've really come to believe is that you cannot lead a powerful and spirit led moment of response to a sermon that you didn't hear. You can't like you can't. you can't. Yeah. It's impossible to like shepherd. And I just think like, man, what if in hearing the preach word of God, mm. the Holy spirit could just prompt you to share a, a scripture that you wouldn't have otherwise right. shared. And like, Absolutely. how many moments do we miss out? And so, uh, in, if you have multiple services, I'm a big fan of either sitting in all the services or sitting in the first one. Like I try yeah. not to wait yeah. till later. I want to like get as early as I can to know, right. man, what are we preaching on? Just in case there's that moment of the spirit leading, maybe something different in the room. And maybe you don't have a culture of spontaneous worship for maybe other listeners, but you know, I think there's still that element of like, man, if, if worship's a response to the revelation of God, then our actual last song, it would be really hard to lead that if you didn't hear the sermon. And so, man, a hundred percent. And, yeah. uh, I sit through all of them. Um, so, yeah. you know, back in the day when we had four services at the congregation I was leading, I sat through all four because the spirit does something different, even though the sermon's the exact same. Um, the Holy Spirit just does different things um, in different services. And so it, yeah. it's not even enough to be at the first one. There have been several moments where I realized, hey, if I wouldn't have been in the room in that third service, I would have missed this thing that God was doing. Wow. Or yeah. uh, this moment where, you know, somebody on the front row was distracting or or they, you know, fell on their knees um, and were just broken by, by God in the most beautiful way. I would have missed that if I wouldn't have been in the room. And so I think wow. engagement for sure is like during the actual uh, worship song part, but it's before that, it's after that, it's during the sermon, it's at the end when we have an opportunity for people to come to the front and be prayed over. Um, wow. You know, we try to remind our, our bands like, hey, you have the most face time in front of a congregation on any given Sunday. You were up there longer than the person preaching. You were up there longer than... Um, the person giving announcements or doing a whatever. Um, and so yeah. you're a leader, whether you realize it or not, you're a leader and a culture shaper. And so not only sit on the front row, but like be engaged in the sermon, like talk back to the, yeah. people, like nod your head along, take notes. Even if you take notes four times, man, watch how God like speaks in a different way, wow. um, even yeah. to you. And then man, even in like, we have a, a culture in, in like our meetings where, um, hey, if you're in a meeting, there's no option for you to have like, you know, that, that resting mean face that we can all have. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> right. There's no option for that. It's like, no, no, you're a leader. You are a leader. Yep. So engage in everything. Staff meetings, man, I want all the worship leaders to be on the front row, like leading out by example, shepherding the room just by being wow. engaged. All of that is huge. It, it, all, it all adds up. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of a funny question, but I think someone listening to this right now could be like, okay, that sounds well and good. And, you know, Aaron Ivy's influential and he, and he's a great, and I, I, their teachings and crowd, but like, but what's it actually like you sat through four times is every sermon, just like the spirit did something so powerful and unique or, or is it just the mundane? Like sometimes you hear the fourth sermon and he tripped over some words and you're like, Oh yeah, nothing special. And yet you don't stop doing it. You still engage like what, yeah. you know, someone someone listening at has that kind of question. Like, what are your thoughts for no, that I would, person? Dude, I would say 95% of the time, uh, it's out of discipline. You know, it's not out yeah. of like, Oh man, God spoke to me every single service in a different way. 95% yeah. of the time, it's just me being disciplined and showing up and realizing I'm a pastor here. And so as a pastor, I'm only here, you know, with these people for an hour and a half. And so how can I not like train myself and even discipline myself? to be present in the room. I'm their, I'm their shepherd. I'm their pastor. You know, yeah. and what does it communicate to them yeah. if I just bail or go get coffee um, from the, the lobby? Yeah, um, yeah so, absolutely. 95% yeah, of the time, it's, it's like, okay, uh, yep, I heard it already. Yes, okay. Yes, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be engaged because that's my role, you know, and I want to do it well. Yeah. 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 That's so good. And even if, you know, maybe like it, in my, my last church, I was pastoral staff, this church, I'm not 
pastoral staff. But no matter what, the, it is true of us that as worship leaders, like you said, you're up in front. And I don't know uh, how you guys do your teaching, but when I was at Fellowship and now at Candeo, we have a team teaching model. So a yeah. lot of teachers, right. you come 10 weeks in a row, you might hear six different preachers, you know, it's like a lot of different. And so the oh. worship leader in a lot of these contexts, not only in the service, are you actually on stage more than whoever's teaching, but in a month you might lead three or four that pastor mm-hmm. might only preach once. Mm-hmm. Like you really do become yeah. uh, a significant portion of the face of what new people are starting to see and recognize. And they're going to look to your leadership. When you sit on the front row, they go, yeah. okay. Like he actually believes this. And when right, they never right. see you in the room, they might think like, dude, our worship leaders don't even like, why should I come to church? They don't yeah. even come to church. Absolutely, and so, man. yeah, Absolutely. that's super helpful to think through. Whether um, pastor is in the title or not does not matter. Um, yeah. Worship leading is pastoral in nature. And I think yeah, some absolutely some men and women both like in the worship leading um, role kind of think, well, I'm not really a pastor because that's not in my mm-hmm. title. Um, I'm yeah. just the worship leader. And man, I just want to like kill that and um, remind people like, no, you are pastoral just by the very nature of what your calling is as a worship leader. Yeah. And also not just worship leader, but drummer and bass player and any musician that's up there there's a pastoral nature to that role and so whether somebody gives you that title or not like live up to that live up to that yeah um calling on your so life. good um yeah yeah uh, all right. One last question. And then we'll do a series of rapid fire kind of fun stuff to just okay. end out our time. But, mm-hmm. uh, if you were going to shepherd your congregation to grow in engagement, it may be within the Sunday morning context. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you lead like midweek, like we have a college service that several hundred students come to. So maybe you're in a midweek, it doesn't have to be Sunday mornings, but you're in a, a, a leadership context, shepherding a congregation. <laughs> what would be like some ways that you might encourage or pastor your people to have a more biblical view of expression and engagement in worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In in our Sunday liturgy, we have built in every single week, um, a shepherding moment that, uh, the worship leader, um, is, uh, is leading. And so sometimes that shepherding moment can be uh, a call and response, or it could be, um, you know, uh, a testimony. It can be reading scripture or reading an ancient prayer or something like that. There's a shepherding moment. And the reason that we do that is like, that's the opportunity. It's only three to five minutes, but that's an opportunity where you get to teach worship. Like, yeah. This is why we sing today. This is why we lift up our hands. These are a couple of postures that I just want to show you are in the Psalms, you know, practice that today. That shepherding mm-hmm. moment piece also keeps us from just being in a rut of just like playing a song and then playing a song and then playing a song. But a yeah. reminder of I'm um, shepherding people through this liturgy to get to the sermon where the word of God is preached. And then I'm shepherding them to respond to that word that was preached over them. And, uh, you know, some churches call it a call to worship or uh, there might be a, you know, a benediction at the end or whatever, but those are all moments. Those are opportunities to shepherd people and, and to take that opportunity and go, Hey, just real quick. I just want to remind you why we sing. Here's why we sing. You know, I want to remind you today why we want you to, uh, to actually jump in and not just watch and listen. Here's why, you know, giving yep. them the why and explaining that over time that stacks up in a, in a believer's life and it is actually discipling them. It's discipling them towards an understanding of what worship is and what worship isn't. Yep. Absolutely. That's so good. Well, to finish out, I'd love to just ask a couple of quick questions, just kind of a fun, okay. lighthearted way to end, which, all right, you're in a coffee shop in Austin. What's your go-to coffee shop and go-to order? My go-to coffee shop right now is called Barrett's and it's uh, very close to our office. So it's usually the place I stopped before cool. and it's a uh, black drip coffee with a splash of oat milk. Awesome. All right. If you're going to recommend one book right now to a worship leader watching this, what's the book recommendation? Oh man. Uh, the one book, um, gosh, dude, gentle and lowly by Dane, Dane Ortland. Very good. All right. Favorite social media platform, Instagram. Although our entire church is fasting from uh, social media during, uh, this nice. seven week series that we're in right now, but Instagram would be my favorite. Very cool. All right. Uh, two more questions. Favorite worship song to lead right now. Favorite worship song to lead right now. Um, 
you know, we we write a lot of songs for our church. Um, so about half of the songs that we use in a normal Sunday are songs written like by our people for our people. And there is uh, one that is just an absolute blast to uh, to get to lead right now. And it kind of came from uh, a, a very real season in our church, you know, during COVID and all that kind of stuff. So it's called Less of Me and More of You. That's my favorite song to lead right now. Mm. Very cool. I love yeah. it. Last question would be, okay, one piece of gear that's your favorite thing to use while you're leading worship? Favorite gear? Um, I'm not really like a gear gearhead. You know what I mean? Good. I have a guitar Good. that I love. I play a, uh, What's your guitar? There's a, a man in our church. His name is Mark Lineberg. Um, he builds Collings guitars, which are like known as like some of the best guitars on the whole planet, right? Well, he, yeah, he they builds are. Those guitars. And cool. he um, also has like a little side gig where he makes guitars with his name on it that are modeled after Collings. So he made me a guitar. It's called a Mark Lineberg guitar. And it's a little cool. parlor guitar, uh, like a 12 fret, um, little small, tiny guitar. And that's my favorite. It's awesome. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Hopefully, if you're a worship leader watching this, uh, you weren't just encouraged, but maybe challenged. And maybe this week, you'll be thinking of some ways that you can help your church grow and engagement, help your team to engage people better. And as always, uh, if you found this helpful, you can like it on YouTube. You can uh, leave a review in whatever podcasting app you're listening to it on. And hopefully, you'll come back and see another episode if you found this helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching.